Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. It is really my great pleasure to welcome you to the Brookings Doha Center's first webinar event. Um, Salaamu Alaikum wa Asadullahu Naharukum Aina Matuntum. Yusaydani and Urahib Bikum fi Awali Nedwa, Yunazim Hamarkas Brookings Doha Abra Internet. Um, like many organizations, um, the Brookings Doha Center uh, has been adapting to the requirements of our work um, and this new reality, this new virtual reality. Uh, two housekeeping issues before we begin our event today. Uh, first, in order to stay true to our mission of serving the people of the MENA region, we are providing simultaneous translation in Arabic. To select English, please use the English interpretation channel below and click on mute original audio. Um, سنستخدم اليوم قناة اللغة العربية اللغة الفرنسية للترجمة الفورية باللغة العربية لاختيار اللغة العربية الرجاء النظر إلى الأسفل والنقر على French و mute original audio عبر برنامج Zoom. Um, the second issue is I would like to um, or the second uh, thing to consider is I'd like to apologize in advance for any technical issues. This is our first webinar using Zoom and we are still learning all its functions. Please help us by informing us of any technical issues you encounter um, or ways that we might improve the experience for our next event. Uh, these can be communicated through the chat function below on Zoom or by email. Um, so under the COVID uh, pandemic, we find ourselves uh, all living in challenging and uncertain times. Uh, many people living in vulnerable communities throughout the world are facing especially difficult circumstances and hardships. Such globally disruptive events not only test our abilities to handle challenges, but they also shed light on deeper structural issues in our communities and our countries. They present us with an opportunity as well to reflect on our conditions in order to improve both ourselves and our communities. So in the coming weeks, the Brookings Doha Center will be organizing a number of webinars to shed light on some of these issues. We will be tackling these issues using new techno technologies and new tools and innovative communication channels. Um, these are all prompted by the pandemic. So these are not things that we're familiar with, but they were available. So again, this is one of the, the, the developments or let's say the hopefully positive elements that we're going through right now. Um, so indeed, we are coming to you live for a conversation with experts in four different countries and an audience of around 500 people that spans the world. So. We begin our discussion um, on the economic challenges facing Arab Gulf states. These involve both the short-term economic disruptions of the pandemic, hopefully short-term, um, and the long-term impact of the falling oil, oil prices. GCC governments have announced economic stimulus packages that total across the countries to close to $100 billion to help the private sector and the countries absorb the shock of the crisis. So the GCC countries must also ensure that the stimulus package is used effectively and redouble their efforts to diversify their economies. They also must work together to mitigate the social impact of these dual challenges. We are honored today to have with us an esteemed panel of experts. Um, Dr. Ha professor Hatem Shanfari is a professor with the Department of Economics and Finance at Sultan Qaboos University in Oman. Samantha Gross is a fellow with the Foreign Policy Program and the Energy Security and Climate Initiative at the, Brooking, at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. And Dr. Nasser Saidi is president of Nasser Saidi and Associates and former Minister of Economy and Industry and former Vice Governor of the Central Bank of Lebanon. So welcome everyone to our discussion today. We are going to have a short discussion with the panelists um, and then after we're going to op open for questions and answers. All attendees um, to the seminar have the chance to submit questions via the question or Q&A option in the Zoom webinar. Those can be submitted anonymously during any time or during the time allocated to Q&A. So um, let me begin with, uh, with you, Nasser. Um, a major agreement was announced this week to cut oil production levels. Um, so what will be on the, we're all looking Looking at the oil markets and the oil prices, what do you, what in your estimation will be the impact, um, and and how long term will be the impact uh, given these these production cuts? 
Well, this is this has been hailed as a historic cut by OPEC Plus uh, to be joined in principle by North American producers, i.e. US, uh, Mexico, hopefully, uh, Canada even, and to the tune maybe of some 12.7 million barrels per day. So it looks like an extraordinary amount. And indeed it is, it's practically meant to be 10% of world production. However, um, the short point is that it is too little, too late, because we have a large fall in demand. And if we look at the estimate forecasts of how much fall in demand there is, we're talking anywhere between 22 million barrels per day to 32, 33 million barrels per day as of current forecasts. Now, the World Bank and the IMF are now calling for a major recession at a global level. IMF saying about minus 3.3% global growth. And this is the first time in effect since the Second World War that we actually have both developing countries as well as advanced countries having a fall in demand. So although the cut will help, it does not get rid of the excess supply in the market. The second, even if you cut supply, you have a problem with storage. We are now reaching the maximum levels of storage available, whether onshore or even offshore. You now have super tankers just about full. So if you look at by the end of this month, you will be running out of storage capacity. What that means, of course, is that you're going to have to start shutting down wells, shutting down production. It also may have an impact, of course, on refineries. As a side issue to complicate matters, if you think of um, fuel for airlines, gasoline fuel for airlines, that cannot be kept in storage. Its chemical composition gets affected if it is in storage, so you would have to reprocess it. So bottom line is um, the price support that you might have gotten from this cut is I don't think is going to be there. The risks are all on the downside. We're now running around $30 per barrel, but I think the risks are on the downside. Why? Because we have a major recession, probably the greatest we've had since the Great Depression. It is global in its scope, and then it affects certain sectors more than others, in particular trade and transport. And those are extremely important for the oil industry and for us to supply. In addition to that, our major client for oil from the GCC countries is China. And China represented something like 75% of the increase in oil demand over the past couple of years. When China's growth declines and potentially China itself could go into recession, then you're getting a big hit. So overall, although the agreement by OPEC plus uh, is helping, it does not resolve the issue of excess supply. And I'm relatively pessimistic in that the excess supply is going to increase, not decrease. So Q2 2020, I think is going to see a continuing decline. Mm -hmm. By the time you might get a recovery in Q3, Q4, but I think that is subject to a great deal of uncertainty. Remember that you've got a combination of three major shocks. You've got a global health crisis which is affecting both supply and demand across the economies of the world and affects all our countries as well. You've got uh, the effect of COVID, you've got the effect of COVID on trade and production globally. And then for us, you've got in addition to that, an oil crisis. Uh, so these, although they are intermingled factors, they combine to give us a shock we have never had in the Arab world or particularly in the GCC countries. That is historically unprecedented. 
the net result, of course, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get into the discussion, is that it's going to lead to large budget deficits. It's going to lead to current account deficits for the GCC countries. It's going to require a lot of adjustment. And even the package that is now of stimulus that is now being proposed, in fact, it, it jumps up to about 170 billion if you include all the financial stimulus proposed recently, including by the UAE, that would come out to about 10% of GDP. But in fact, the shock to GDP in the region is likely to be, and particularly to revenues, is probably going to be of the order of 250 billion. That is a big shock for the GCC countries. So even the stimulus packages that have been proposed, although welcome, may not be able to compensate for these large shocks. So a lot of the issues that are going to arise are what sort of policy response can you put in place? There is a number of health policy responses. We, we know those. But then you need to ask, do you have the monetary policy and in particular the fiscal policy responses? Do you have the automatic stabilizers uh, which the West countries, Europe and United States, have those automatic stabilizers. Unfortunately, we don't have those automatic stabilizers. We don't have unemployment insurance and the like. So a lot of policy issues will also be asked. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Nasser. So we're gonna to come to a discussion on, um, on the financial situation, I think in the next round. Let me, let me go to Samantha and, and get her sense as well. Um, do you think we've seen the uh, the bottom? Uh, how, what what what's the trajectory uh, reflecting on Nasser's comments of of the OPEP plus deals that were made? Um, what's your sense of where the oil market is headed? Thank you, Nader. I'm smiling, not that you can hear me. Um, I agree with everything that Nasser had said, and I will try to add a little bit of color on how this all looks from the North American side. Um, oil demand has just fallen off a cliff um, because so much of the world is in lockdown to deal with the effects of the, of the crisis and transportation makes up 60% of global oil demand. We've just seen a, a, just a complete stop of the likes we've never seen in oil demand. Um, just as an example, gasoline demand in the United States is down nearly 50% from its level a year ago. We've never seen anything like this. I think it's also to think about how this is playing out in North America and why that matters. It's helpful to go back and think a bit about the earlier OPEC plus meeting in, in early March that was just an unmitigated disaster. The Russians wouldn't even to modest cuts in response to the outbreak. And then the Saudis responded by saying they would abandon all restraint and just produce flat out, despite the fact that demand was plummeting. So as a result, you saw oil prices just fall through the floor. They've rebounded a bit, but as Nasser said, rent crude is right now just over $30 a barrel. And these actions really created havoc, they particularly created havoc among the political world in the United States. Um, we had politicians, particularly on the Republican side, which has been kinder to Saudi Arabia in the US political uh, sense, but Republicans in particular just accusing Saudi Arabia of economic warfare and of trying to kill the U.S. crude oil industry. Um, it's also been interesting to watch President Trump's actions throughout all this. He likes to uh, bat around the idea of energy dominance. However, it became very clear that there's precious little he can do in an oil market like this to help the U.S. producers. The truth is, is that prices are down because demand has just fallen off the edge of the earth. And there's little that President Trump or really anyone else can do in a situation like that. And so the, the month-long spat that happened between the Russians and the Saudis um, raised a lot of political issues here in the United States and kind of got our politicians going. But I agree with Nasser that in the overall scheme of things, I don't think that intervening month will make a darn difference in oil markets. 
Um, crude oil storage is filling rapidly. Um, I've seen estimates that it could fill in a matter of weeks. But I don't know that it's super relevant to think about when global capacity fills. I think it's more important to look at that on a regional basis and think about when, when producers in different regions need to shut in their production. Um, and Sunday's OPEC plus deal, I think, will buy us a little extra time with respect to storage filling and also maybe give the industry time for a bit more orderly shutdown, which I think will be helpful. But yes, the, the kinds of production cuts that were talked about are nowhere near enough to balance the market and more capacity needs to be shut in. And if you think about producers you know, outside the OPEC agreement that are making very economic decisions about when to produce, they're looking at their going forward per, per barrel costs to decide when to shut in. And they're also thinking about the potential costs and the potential difficulties for reservoirs of shutting in production and then having to bring it back. And so those costs factor into their decision making as well. And these are hard decisions for operators. But I think it's extremely likely, I agree with Nasser, that prices are going to need to fall further to, produce, to force more producers to shut in oil and to balance the market. And I can't pretend that I know where that price level is. And how long demand will stay so low is really an epidemiological question. It's a question about the virus and how long it takes us to get the virus under control and how long we need to be doing these mitigation actions and social distancing actions in order to keep the virus under control. But this could be a while, and the longer it is, the more bearish it is for oil prices. And even though producers in the Gulf states have among the lowest oil production costs in the world, their fiscal budgets depend on much higher prices. Um, Saudi Arabia has among the world's lowest production costs, but I typically hear of a fiscal break-even cost of around $85 a barrel. And that doesn't even take into account how many barrels need to be sold at $85 in order to balance the budget. I think we think of a more normal 100 barrel a day oil market when those prices are calculated, whereas we don't have a 100 barrel a day oil market right now. And so there's no question that this comes at a really difficult, difficult time for the Gulf economies as they try to adapt their economies. And it takes money to make investments and that money is not coming in right now. Thank you, Samantha. Um, Hatim, I'd like to uh, go to you now in terms of looking at this. Um, so what can the GCC countries do to mitigate uh, the current drop in oil and potentially hedge against the risk of even further drops in the future that are, that are being mentioned by Samantha and Nasser? Um, you have to turn on your unmute, Hatim. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me well? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, with the hedging process, which is uh, using financial contracts to sell commodity like oil in the uh, financial markets ahead of time, where you will have specified price that you can pick up in the future. This has been a character for uh, Mexico case for more than 20 years, and they have been spending a lot of money trying to hedge that risk against the uh, drop in oil prices. So if you buy a put option, which gives you the right to sell your product sometimes in the future at fixed price, that will weather the storm as we are experiencing currently. For oil producers, uh, it's a big shock for the Gulf states. Whereas in the case of Mexico, it has been much more uh, controlled because of this hedging process they have put in place. Hedging can be used for producers as well as users. For example, airlines tend to hedge their cost, especially when they expect the oil price to go up. They, so they buy call options, and these call options tend to uh, stream out the cost for their operation. So whether it's producer or, uh, or uh, uh, consumers, the financial contracts are a very useful tool to control the upside or downside part of the risk of the price that tend to swing quite uh, uh, significantly as we are experiencing currently. So the hedging process has not been used in the Gulf much. It has been experimented with Qatar, for example, but most of the other Gulf states has not used this. 
and therefore the shock it's really big for their uh, financial especially from the fiscal point of view and therefore to deal with this situation it has been quite a shock for them to uh, try to manage and this has come very sudden as well as extremely low prices as has been mentioned by both Nasser and uh, Samantha. So uh, hedging is a process that we should think about it. It's costly, but it provides an excellent insurance to weather the storm and to give you time to think and try to plan forward in a much better way than having to face the shock and disrupt the public finance as well as providing services and uh, stimulating the private sector in any country, especially like the Gulf states. Uh, thank you, Hatim. So I'm gonna let's let's. This is a good place to go back uh, to Nasir and, and and pick up the discussion about we there there's a there's going to be a uh, with with the current low prices and potentially even more pressure in the future. Uh, you mentioned the issue of budget deficits. There's going to be current account deficits, and the fact that uh, the the financial or economic stimulus packages that are being uh, that's being uh, that are being rolled out across the the GCC. Um, as well as the loosening up of some of the, um, the controls, such as uh, minimum reserve requirements in banks that, that unlocks even additional funding may not be enough. What is your sense um, in terms of where the GCC countries are going, which countries are the most vulnerable right now, and what can be done? Or what should they be thinking about doing, including, uh, for example, hedging? Right. Uh, I, I agree with Hatem on the issue of, um, of hedging, except that um, what we're talking about <clears throat> is a very big shock in terms of the oil market. I'm not sure that the futures market and the hedge market has sufficient liquidity to absorb the sort of shock we, we're talking about. So particularly if it gets extended and particularly given, given the magnitude. And I just want to add another element to our discussion. <clears throat> Namely, we're also living a financial crisis. We've seen stock markets and bond markets melt down. And that, of course, means a wealth effect for the GCC countries. Remember, or our sovereign wealth funds or our national investment funds are all typically highly invested in the Western markets, which have seen the largest declines. So that has an impact, of course, on the sovereign wealth funds. They're having to liquidate some of their holdings, particularly of short-term money instruments like treasury bills and the like, because governments in the GCC are going to be starting to call on them in order to finance their budgets. We've already seen uh, both Abu Dhabi and uh, Saudi Arabia come to the markets in terms of issuance. Uh, that's not going to be as easy for other countries in the region, particularly Bahrain, Oman, don't have the ease of access to the markets and it's going to be much more costly for them. I mention this because, <clears throat> because of this all big decline in revenues and the current account deficits that are going to come out, liquidity is going to dry up in the banking system. Our economies across the Arab world, but particularly in GCC country, countries, are highly dependent on the banking system for providing finance. Once liquidity starts drying up, and even if you have the encouragement from the central banks through lowering reserve requirements, uh, increasing uh, loan ratios and, and the like, it does not necessarily mean that you're going to actually going to get an injection of credit into, into the market. And so you've got vulnerable countries I mentioned uh, Bahrain, uh, Oman, and other countries across the region because they have relatively high levels of debt. If you look at just the average for the GCC, it's about 33%. But once you get to Oman, you're talking about 64% uh, debt, debt to GDP. Uh, Bahrain, Bahrain as well, you're talking about 49% and, and, it's, and it's growing because of, of large budget deficits. And of course, you've got these break-even prices, which Samantha was pointing to. Uh, the break-even prices across, across the region uh, for, for a country like Oman is about $87, $88 per barrel. Uh, for, for Bahrain, it's $92 per barrel. Um, and that is under normal circumstances, i.e. you have sources of domestic revenue. 
your, your non-oil sector helps a little bit if, you, if you're diversified. So it is a source of revenue. But unfortunately, and I, and I hate to be as pessimistic, the non-oil sector is going to get badly hit because as usual, governments in the region follow pro-cyclical policies, fiscal policies. So they tend to cut down spending. We've already seen that in terms of development projects, infrastructure projects. And of course, that directly impacts the non-oil sector. But on top of all that, let's go back to the health crisis. The health crisis is going to mean that the Hajj, the Hajj might have to be canceled this year. We've had 40 occasions over history where the Hajj has been canceled. We've already had the Umrah, effective Umrah travel canceled. So the impact on, on tourism, religious tourism and the Hajj will be an additional impact for all the region. Because remember, you attract two to three million people coming in who spend 10 to 15 days. You've got Ramadan coming up where people are not going to be spending as much as they usually would spend. So all that, the health, the health impacts are going to add to the financial impact and to the, the reduction in trade to the impact of the oil price. So unfortunately, it's a combination of factors that really make it a perfect storm. And even though the countries of the region have responded through proposing stimulus packages, much of the stimulus packages is of a monetary and financial nature. My fear is that that is not going to be sufficient. You don't have unemployment insurance, for example, across the countries of the region. You don't have social programs that can help, that can help people. Um, many of those, what we call automatic fiscal stabilizers are simply not there because you simply don't have the tax systems. In other countries, in the US and elsewhere, uh, your tax declines and you keep more cash flow within the company. We don't have that because the only general tax that we have is VAT and even that is limited to the UAE and Saudi uh, and, and more recently Bahrain. So we need to go back to rethinking how we want to deal with these crises. Diversification is of course a big word, but diversification is not going to help you in 2020 or 2021, particularly when the particular sectors you are counting on for diversification are going to be the worst hit apart from oil. Thank you, Nasser. Um, sorry, Samantha, not, I'd like... not, sorry not to be more encouraging. No, we're going to have to come back to the issue of diversification and what can be done. Um, I think the place to start I, might be with, with Samantha. Samantha, Hati mentioned um, uh, Mexico uh, as well in terms of uh, their use of hedging. And, and there's other countries in the world that are, that are looking at um, what can be done uh, in terms of uh, mitigating measures. Um, I believe you you currently are in Mexico and and they may have some insights to share with us on on what they're doing and others are doing that could benefit uh, countries of the GCC as they think through these issues. Well, and I think the most interesting thing that's happening in Mexico, um, I agree with both Nasser and Hatem. The Mexicans have hedged some of that their production at the higher oil prices that we saw at the end of last year and earlier this year, and that will help them to keep producing. And that was. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. That was some that was some of the problem. That was some of the reason why they didn't want to to agree with the production cuts that were being asked of them. But another thing that happened and that led to Mexico's reaction over the weekend is has to do with actually internal Mexican politics and how oil fits into their economies. Um, and and, and there, there might be some lessons learned, but it's also just somewhat helpful to think about how other countries approach their national oil companies. Pemex is certainly very important to Mexico, but it's not you know, the crown jewel of, of the country, perhaps in a way that, say, QP or Aramco would be. 
But it is interesting to think about. The current president ran very much on a populist platform and something that was really important to him was we've kind of been referring to it as make Pemex great again. Um, Pemex has been in debt. They are, they've, their primary uh, most important field, Contrarel, has been declining. And so he was really focused on bringing it back as a crown jewel of, of the Mexican economy and the Mexican energy system. Um, they're building a new refinery here, which may or may not be a good idea, <laughs> but that's not the discussion we're having today. But because he has this very strong, I'm going to bring production back, I'm going to make Pemex back into the crown jewel of the Mexican economy. It was extremely difficult for the Mexican oil minister to agree to cuts that were put on them from the outside. Extremely difficult, despite the fact that clearly the bottom has fallen out of the, of the oil market and, this, and that this is very difficult for them. Some of that production is hedged, but some of the production that they're refusing to shut down is likely uneconomic at today's oil prices. Um, and that hedge doesn't last forever. And it's an interesting question of whether Mexico will continue to produce even if, that, even if they're losing money out of that oil because of the political necessity of keeping production at Pemex up for President, Lo President Lopez Obrador. And I think that's something interesting to think about, not just here in Mexico, but in other places as well, where production decisions are kind of a mix of the political and, and the economic, and that people won't necessarily cut production in ways that you would think they would have on purely economic terms, because other things come into play the way they do here in Mexico. And so it adds a wrinkle of difficulty to how we think about the oil market and how orderly, I mean, you, as an economist, you sort of think we'll move down the cost curve, the most expensive oil will shut down, this will be an orderly process, but oil is special and it doesn't necessarily work that way. I think that's a lesson to take from here in Mexico. Wow, okay, so basically um, there, there's limited lessons that the GCC can benefit except the fact that, you know, like you said, oil is complicated and, and in fact uh, they, they have to they have to kind of look to their own devices to some extent. Yeah. Um, Hatim, now that uh, Nasser mentioned um, the issue of uh, even now the, the idea of economic diversification may be difficult because Many of the sectors that are being championed by GCC countries are the ones that are most likely to get hit currently with uh, the lower financial resources uh, available. Um, so where do you see the challenges uh, facing the private sector activities uh, in the GCC? Do you agree with that assessment? And uh, how, how, how will economic diversification efforts play out? What are the alternative pathways that, that GCC countries can take? In the short term, there is a major challenge for private sector to operate, especially because a lot of payments that are due from the government is not being uh, paid. And this is just going to accumulate even more and make it even more challenging. Uh, for the SMEs, it will even be much more challenging than the large corporate. And that's again, in the short term, is going to be a very, very difficult situation to deal with. Uh, unemployment is, as we are all aware of it, globally is going to be uh, a case in point that we have to deal with it. Lack of uh, unemployment insurance is going to be playing out. Many youth in the region who are looking forward for employment are not likely to realize their, uh, their uh, uh, dream of getting a job anytime soon. So uh, in the short term, it's going to be a very serious issue. In my view, most of the government in the region would have the top priorities to keep paying the public sector salaries. And in this environment, when the cost of production for some countries is very high, close to $30, it's, that will even be so difficult to make. Because for these countries, like in the shale oil industry in the US, when you are having cost close to $30, you are actually now operating below the cost. And as Samantha is saying, it's very difficult to shut down. You have to continue to pump, even though you, are, you know that you are losing in this case. In the long term, when you look at the medium to short long term, uh, we have to refigure out uh, the way we have been pursuing uh, the, uh, diversification in the past. I think our policies has been experimenting with so many different ideas and so many different sectors. And we don't have, we haven't seen much progress on that account. That progress in diversification has been very tied up 
to the oil sector and the oil prices. So when oil prices goes down, everything is affected very badly. Look at, uh, for example, the role model that we can look at at Dubai. Dubai is a highly diversified economy. Their reliance on oil is very limited. But look what's happening there. A lot of stress is happening in the system. And the oil price is playing indirect role in the activities there. The pandemic is an issue, but the uh, other economic activities is being affected equally, as in the case of, for example, Bahrain, Oman, or Saudi Arabia on that account, or many other countries in the Gulf. So uh, diversification should be medium to long term, reconstituting our approach to it rather than the way we have done it in the past. And we're trying to figure out a better way to think about it because the way we have tried it in the past have not given the right fruit for us. Uh, thank you, Hatim. I'm going to turn to some of the questions. We're now getting questions from the, the audience. And the first couple of questions are actually related. And they're asking uh, to what extent, what, ex what can the GCC countries uh, kind of do as a group um, uh, to, 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 to counter uh, to, to mitigate the effects of the current economic challenges that they face, um, uh, not, not just individually. And uh, uh, Nasser, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure. I think um, what, one issue um, concerns the, the financial sector and financial flows and pressure on currencies. Yeah. Uh, particularly insofar as countries like Bahrain and Oman are concerned. So one thing you can do, and I would certainly advocate it, is to have a currency swap program uh, for the central banks of the region. Uh, that would allow uh, some of the central banks to borrow from each other. We're all dollar-based, of course. Uh, some of the larger central banks, uh, like Sama and the UAE central banks, could also organize swaps with the Fed. The Fed has opened up the gates for currency swaps. That tends to re help you in terms of liquidity shocks. So I would certainly advocate that. The second, I think, is to start thinking a bit more in terms of what can I do in terms of a solidarity fund. The Europeans, of course, have, are the best example and also the worst example of how solidarity funds can work. But by and large, the Europeans have put together packages on a communal, on a communal, community-wide basis for the EU. This is the time, I think, at which you want to start thinking maybe of aid packages across, across the GCC. This was done, as you know, with Bahrain a couple of years ago, uh, to the tune of about 10 billion plus. I think we need, probably need to multiply that. Um, and the ability is there. I mean, it is a very large shock, but nevertheless, there are fiscal buffers uh, for the two largest, two, three largest countries in the region, uh, Saudi, um, UAE, and Kuwait and Qatar have the ability to help other countries in the region. So this is a time at which I think you need maybe to overcome differences, sit down together, and start thinking of how can I coordinate policy across, across the GCC. One area could be the labor market. This is the time I would say advocate for having a passport, a, a labor passport, yeah? allowing greater mobility across the GCC countries. Uh, you might be dreaming, but this is the time to dream because you simply don't have policy instruments. This is the time at which you want to start thinking of maybe establishing a social security system. Uh, it can be put together fairly quickly, but remember, and this is subject we, we didn't get around to, you have a large number of expatriates uh, in, 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 in the GCC. And it's not clear what the prospects are for many of those expatriates. Um, the GCC countries are there to support their nationals, that is excellent. But what do you do about the expatriates? You risk losing them. And if you risk losing the expatriates, the recovery process of the economies is going to become more uncertain and more difficult and more costly. So this is the time, I think, at which you want to rethink 
immigration policy, even though it is difficult circumstances, but we need to think strategically on longer term. How do I preserve that human capital? I need it for diversification. I need it for production. So let's start thinking in terms of a social security system, which would mean that people would contribute. It would mean that you have a tool when you have these large shocks to help people bear the, bear the burden. So I think there are a number of tools you can start bringing. And finally, I think um, even though you have limited forms of taxation, I think uh, reducing, <clears throat> reducing VAT would help it, at least in the short term uh, in terms of <clears throat> when you want to get around to some recovery. So quite a few tools that, that you could begin developing. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just to give credit to the two, to people asking the questions, those were from uh, Shalom Mohammed and um, Philip uh, Petkov uh, regarding what GCC countries can do to work together. Um, I have another question from uh, the, I see the, Franz Michael. I don't see the last name, it's cut off, but it's actually asking about um, the risk of accelerated demand destruction for oil and oil products, um, both from the coronavirus and the energy transition. Uh, so transitioning to alternative fuels, um, that, from what I understand. So maybe Samantha, you can, you can look at this. So how does this, how does the oil situation interplay with other energy sources? Um, do the low oil prices mean that they, they have, uh, they're now more competitive, so things are delayed, or that, um, or what, what might happen? It's a great question. Um, and I, I've seen some really interesting writing on this over the last month or so, with some on the, on the environmental side saying, isn't it fantastic? We're seeing greenhouse gas emissions going down. Isn't this a good thing? Which just makes me put my head in my hands. This is absolutely not the way you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is not a sign of any sort of positive energy transition. This is an, an economic disaster and a human health disaster, and we can't really view it as anything else. That said, there are very interesting questions about whether this will further a transition towards, towards less fossil fuel use or impede that transition. And I personally am more concerned that it will actually impede that transition. Um, for one reason, transitioning the energy system to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce the use of fossil fuels in certain sectors requires investment. And investment is exactly what's not happening right now. Um, companies are holding back. They don't know how long we're going to be in this situation. They're seeing energy demand plummet and they don't know how long it's going to stay that way. So the investment environment across the board is just at a standstill right now because of the level of uncertainty. And so investments that might have happened to further along an energy transition are not happening right now. Another thing that is also the case is that fossil fuels are inexpensive because they're in such an extreme state of oversupply. If you think just about an ordinary consumer thinking about buying a new vehicle, an alternative fueled vehicle, an electric vehicle perhaps, is less attractive right now because oil prices are so low. And it's unclear how, price, how, how long those prices are going to stay low. But it might be a while. And so I think the combination of inexpensive fossil fuels and this just halt to investment of all kinds during the crisis is likely setting the world back in terms of energy transition rather than moving it forward. You do see some countries pushing to include some investment in greener energy in their stimulus bills. That has been more popular, say, in Europe. It's been a difficult sell here in the United States. But the United States Congress isn't done with stimulus yet. We don't have everything we need. And so you might see that in a later uh, edition of a stimulus package. But I think that's likely to be more focused on the electricity sector than on the transportation sector. Thank you, Samantha. Can I, can I just add to, to and, and agree with what Samantha was saying, is that typically, if you look at the 2008, 2007, 2008, uh, great recession, as we call it, 
the stimulus packages tended to help polluting industries. <laughs> I mean, they, 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 they rescued the automobile industry. They went into the construction industry. So the packages we're talking about, particularly in the United States, maybe less so a little bit in Europe, are precisely to help the most polluting industries. The airlines are all going to go to their governments and say, hey, I want to rescue, yeah? And that is going to mean greenhouse gas emissions are going to rise very quickly as soon as you begin getting a recovery. That's exactly what we saw post the, the, the Great Recession, yeah? The greenhouse gas is picked up by about 5.5% immediately thereafter, particularly because the stimulus, packages, yeah, the stimulus packages help them. Now, what you can hope for is to say that people, now that they're breathing cleaner air and they can see the peaks of mountains they haven't seen in 20 years, might turn around and say, hey, maybe this is the time for a Green New Deal. And we orient investments towards climate helping. Uh, but you have to be optimistic and hope that something like that could happen. And remember, I think, you know, COVID-19 COVID is a big shock. I think it's, it's something that several generations have not seen anything like that, maybe since the Second World War. So maybe, just maybe, people will wake up and say, I want to live differently. I want, I can no longer go back to old patterns. And things like telecommuting, e-learning, et cetera, all of that is going to be there. And maybe some people will say, hey, uh, let me have better health. And certainly public health is going to be on the agenda. Uh, we, sh we should probably end on this positive note, actually. But, but actually, there's a lot of questions here that I think Hatim is going to be help, uh, help, uh, can help answer. And, and they relate generally to the fiscal choices uh, that VCC countries will be facing um, with these things. So there's a, there's a group of questions uh, from uh, people like uh, George Becky, um, Osman uh, Sert, Patrick Forbes, that all kind of flow within this. Um, it's looking at basic, asking the questions about government choices. Um, what are the sectors, if you have financial constraints, do the, do the governments focus on? Um, education, we mentioned health, but how about support for, for, different, uh, for different industries? What industries will get more of their attention? Um, and Patrick mentions this in the context of the red tier system. Uh, what, aspects, what aspects of the red tier system should be reformed first in the context of the financial pressures? Interesting questions. Uh, uh, let me put it this way. The priority for the public sector uh, spending is on health and safety at the moment. I think the next important thing is food security for the Gulf states. Food security is a big issue that is coming up. We have noticed that some countries are prohibiting the exports of some of the basic uh, commodities and that's sending very strong signals so you need to make sure that you are secured on the food front so government will spend time will spend resources both in terms of growing uh, their local produce as well as importing enough uh, enough material for their uh, consumption local consumptions industries that are going to produce either medical related uh, equipment or uh, services that will be definitely supported and given a priorities. Those that are likely to help in uh, bridging some of the gap in terms of the import will be uh, targeted uh, in some of those uh, uh, spending uh, that the governments are likely to target. So these are some of the important critical things that the government will be looking at in terms of which sector is likely to be supported more. Education, obviously, ongoing uh, thing that's likely to give uh, full priority from government. And uh, along with that, looking at the industries that are likely to uh, either uh, substitute for uh, import or uh, help the export of some of the goods that uh, creating uh, foreign reserve for the country. So in the, on the fiscal choices, some of the countries here in the region definitely going to draw, as uh, Nasser have stated very clearly, will draw from the reserves. And these reserves are under constraint because last year, 2019, a lot of uh, sovereign wealth funds have done very well when the market are given very high returns. This year, it has quickly turned around. 
lots of losses and still you want them to support the uh, fiscal balance and that's not easy to go forward. So there will be a lot of uh, drawing of the reserves. Uh, then you have the, uh, if it's going to be very difficult to go to the international market to borrow through euro bonds. But I guess as what, uh, Khami, uh, what uh, Nasser is saying, uh, some sort of cooperation is probably going to take place. Countries that are much more exposed are likely to approach those who are less exposed to this uh, pandemic, and they are likely to get some sort of financial assistance. And that's probably what's uh, on the card that's likely to play in the future, very near future. So uh, the reform in terms of uh, rentier economy, obviously, a lot of rationalization of costs that are not necessary, downsizing the government and trying to uh, bring more participation from the public. I see it as a way forward in the future. I would simply add, add to, to what Hatim was just mentioning, one other sector, which is digital. Yeah? Uh, telecommunications and digital will, I think, get a big boost from, from COVID-19, right? Uh, whether we're talking about telecommuting, whether we're talking about e-learning and, and all the rest. So this is a time really where uh, the GCC countries can increase their digital capacity and indeed maybe start using that digital capacity to help other countries in the region which don't have as, as, as much capacity by through e-services, telling them how to put in e-government and, and all the rest. So there might be a silver lining there in terms of greater efficiency by using more digital, digital services. Um, Nasser, thank you. Can you can you also expand on um, the issue of sovereign wealth funds? Uh, Yashin um, Mohabir asks about that actually specifically, and and the trade off of drawing down on the sovereign wealth funds during this time, and and maybe investing the the funds in something that might give them uh, higher economic returns, and it's something that uh, that Hatem touched on briefly as well. Sure. I mean, obviously, the sovereign wealth funds, like any international investor, has been have been hit. Uh, by, 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 the, by the crash in the markets. And I don't see the markets recovering very quickly, yeah? given, given the outlook in terms of the real economy on, on a global basis. So the question is, what should the sovereign wealth funds be doing? I would certainly advocate that the sovereign wealth funds be much more active domestically than they have been in the past. Um, Obviously, governments are going to be calling on them because they, they have to fund some of, some of their spending. But I think sovereign wealth funds have an additional investment um, objective. Namely, they have now garnered and developed a lot of experience on through international investments. Yeah? They've gone into private equity. They've had direct investments in a number of sectors. This is the time at which they should bring that home. In other words, use their expertise and maybe some of the investments they've done externally, internationally, try to bring those into the domestic economy, uh, go into partnerships, more into PPP. That's the sort of thing, maybe go into more into private equity and help revive the local markets. I think this is the time at which the domestic agenda of sovereign wealth funds should be developed. I understand fully well the de-risking from oil agenda, which was the reason why the sovereign wealth funds have been set up. But right now, we're talking about practically an existential threat for the countries of the region. So this is the time at which you want to use your savings. This is the time at which you want to use your sovereign wealth funds to help the countries of the region. That's why they're there. It's no use telling me that I've got billions and hundreds of billions outside if my economy is going to pot. I'm there to help smooth and stabilize income. So I think the domestic agenda now has to be developed. I take example, for example, you could look at uh, Mubadala. Okay, Mubadala uh, has brought in companies like, for example, GE in the past they've gone into partnerships with local companies. So you domesticate some of that internally. Um, so this is the time at which I think they should be using their international expertise to bring in um, more investments and fund those investments locally. 
again through PPP, help privatization, go into private equity. Thank you. Uh, Samantha, looking at these short-term versus long-term trade-offs in terms of uh, decisions, uh, both in terms of energy production as well as diversification and where, where countries, oil, uh, oil and gas producing countries should kind of place their priorities now uh, and, and balance these competing, uh, competing objectives. What's, what's your sense of the priorities? It's a really difficult question. I mean, I, I like the wording that Nasser used that this is an existential crisis. I, I agree with the fact that, that, that dipping into sovereign wealth funds to make local investments is a good idea. Um, I don't think you can lose sight of the fact that this long-term transition in economies needs to occur. Um, but, it, but it is difficult right now to, to make big leaps and big investments into ways that might diversify your economy when, when sort of the foundation of your economy is crumbling. I hate to say that I see this setting back to see diversification plans, but, but in, in many ways I do because it's difficult to sort of build on a foundation when the foundation is having issues itself. So I, I, I don't think the countries can lose sight of their long-term goals right now, but I also think that they, the, the immediate crisis has to be the, the priority. It's getting income to people who are hurting. It's restarting the economy. Um, and it may be a very difficult time for them to maintain focus on their longer-term priorities of economic diversification. It's sad. It's not, it's not the most optimistic view, but it's where I am. Um, thank you, Samantha. Uh, Hatim, there are a couple of questions specifically about Oman and, and to you as well. Um, Akbar Khan and Ibrahim Al Qasimi uh, both are asking about um, uh, Oman being a country that is probably under more fiscal constraints than, than others in the region. Um, assuming Bahrain can rely a bit on Saudi Arabia to help uh, build them out. Um, what are some of the what are some of the the, the political decisions and economic decisions that uh, that are being considered? Ibrahim uh, uh, mentions, you know, is devaluation an option of the currency? Is, is what are what are some of the what are some of the considerations? Well, there is a lot of trade-off for the policymakers currently. It's uh, extremely unusual uh, uh, circumstances they are living with. And uh, Oman has built over the years a very important uh, relationship with its uh, neighbors, uh, especially uh, I would mention Kuwait and uh, Qatar. And I'm sure we will be talking to them in terms of uh, trying to provide some support. Uh, other neighbors, I'm sure, uh, as uh, Nasser has mentioned, in the good spirit of cooperation, uh, it's important to see the GCC in some way intact in terms of its uh, coordination. There is a lot of coordination happening uh, on a daily basis on the health front, health and safety front. And I'm sure there are some coordination going on in spite of the uh, geopolitical issues that we have here. Uh, but there are economic as well as political coordination going on. So uh, the issue of the fiscal challenge is huge for Oman. Uh, but Oman is not going to do it alone. I'm sure uh, neighbors will be able to give some support. Uh, devaluation is not something that you would like to uh, exercise because it's going to create huge economic problem for the country to go for a long time. So uh, I'm sure the, the decision makers are trying to avoid this as much as possible and trying to uh, weather the storm uh, with the local resources as well as uh, resources from France, either from region or beyond the region. Uh, obviously, the IMF is opening up to many countries in the world and they are giving support to those who are asking for it. Uh, Oman can tap that without much of the constraint that will come from the IMF. Reviewing the cost uh, of, uh, uh, of the operation for the country in the physical side, is going on on a, on a constant basis. So that will definitely help, but it's not likely to uh, get us out of this uh, difficult situation. So uh, it all depends on how long the problem is going to last. If it's a matter of weeks and months, it's probably tolerable. But if it goes much longer than this, beyond the end of this year, it's going to co uh, cause a lot of pain. And uh, obviously all the options will be on the table. 
Thank you. So we're coming to the, uh, the end of our webinar, and I'd like to give each of you a chance for a kind of a final word. Um, maybe either a piece of advice to policymakers or better yet, even a note of optimism. Where's the silver lining in all this? Uh, so we can leave our, our viewers and listeners with, with something to, to think about and, 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 and something to take home on a, on a, on a high note. Um, Nasser, can we start with you? Look, I mean, I think um, when, whenever you have large shocks, um, this should come as a wake up call. And as we said, this is not your traditional just oil shock. We obviously the region has had several oil shocks in the past 25 years. One lesson that they learned from that was greater economic diversification. A second lesson they learned was that I need also revenue diversification. Because when you think about diversification, there are three aspects that you need to think of. You need to think of output diversification. You need to think about trade diversification. Even if I diversify output, do I, can I compete internationally and export other than oil? That, that's trade diversification. And the third leg of diversification is revenue diversification, fiscal diversification. I think this is the moment really to start thinking even beyond that, to say, let me think of what I can learn from that shock. And I think this issue of regional cooperation is, is extremely important. I think the issue of how do I best help my private sector becomes very much to the fore. The governments of the region have performing state enterprises. Uh, look at the airlines. They, they, they've, done, they've done a good job in terms of helping them uh, in tourism, hospitality sector, and, and all the rest. So I think this is the time at which you need to think of, number one, greater regional cooperation, uh, particularly in, even in terms of trade and, and facilitating that. And this is the time really to start thinking of what is the long term that, that I want for the countries of the region. Energy, of course, um, is fundamental. But we mentioned during our talk, renewable energy. And renewable energy is becoming directly competitive with fossil fuel. And today, if I want to set up a power plant, I'm, it is cheaper and more competitive to set up a solar-based power plant or wind. That means that I need to wean myself away from oil as quickly as possible because there's shale oil, there's renewable, and I want to avoid the risk of having a lot of stranded assets in 15 to 20 years. That is the big existential risk for the region. So that means education, that means thinking digital, it means much more solidarity and in terms of greater economic integration across the region. So simple answer to your question. Uh, this is the time at which we all should get together, go back to the drawing board and say, look, this, what is happening threatens all of us. And this is where we need to get together and find common solutions. Thank you. Samantha? Thank you. I, I would like to continue this theme of cooperation. I've heard both, both Nasser and Hatim bring this up. Because this is a universal problem and because it's so existential, it's, it's a health threat, it really has at least helped to bring some groups together. Hatim mentioned um, some cooperation across the GCC that perhaps we hadn't seen in the last few years. Um, I think we're seeing greater, greater cooperation among countries and, and a greater understanding that no company can take this on alone. It, this virus, it doesn't respect borders. It doesn't respect such socioeconomic divides. It is completely um, ecumenical in who it chooses to infect. And it, it, I think that helps us understand that we are all in the same boat. And so I hope that the virus fosters cooperation among countries in new ways and also helps us understand that we're all in the same boat. I think there's also some 
possibility that it will foster new ways of working together. I don't think we all want to continue in this socially isolated mode where my primary interactions with other humans are through screens. But on the other hand, I think we have learned that we can collaborate with people through screens to perhaps a greater degree than we thought. And perhaps that will foster new ways of working and greater cooperation, understanding how this technology works and what we can do with it, because we've all gotten a crash course. Yes, we have. Seriously. Uh, thank you, Samantha. Hatim. All right. Uh, so to me, while the policymakers are very focused on cutting, cutting costs and controlling the uh, budget deficit, they should not lose sight on the uh, private sector and how important it is to support, especially the SMEs. Uh, growth in the future is a very important issue that we should not lose sight of. This is very important, but not as critical as we are dealing with uh, managing the fiscal uh, balance at this stage. So policymakers should not lose sight of trying to support the private sector to go through this extremely tough time, as well as thinking about growth and stimulating growth in the future, because uh, that's something that we cannot lose track of it. And we tend to do that in the mix of a crisis that we are facing now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hatem al Shafari, Samantha Gross, Nasser Saidi, thank you so much for joining us. This is our, our first seminar. I'd also like to thank um, the Brookings Doha team, communications, face with projects, and, and, and the research team that helped pull all this together, as well as the two translators who've been with us throughout uh, the, this event. And as well to our audience, thank you for joining us. Um, we look forward to seeing you again soon with another, with another event. Thank so you. thanks, everyone. Thank thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.